Welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, we're going to be catching up on a couple of weeks of uh, city council meetings. Um, we're going to be talking firstly about the citizen input hearing for the tennis rights ordinance that just happened uh, last night. Uh, we're going to give um, an update on where we're at with the um, elections, the candidates, and the process. Um, then we're going to go over three weeks of city council meetings. Uh, the budget was uh, was approved. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to show one clip in particular from the budget hearings that we thought um, were interesting, but we have put more online if you'd like to view those. Um, we're going to talk about where, uh, an update from the Ordinance and Rules Committee um, on the MBTA's Communities Act. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Master Plan Committee, which we haven't talked about in a little bit, but they did meet and interested in uh, what they had to say. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about private ways um, that came up, as well as the Lexington Solar Farm. Um, so joining us this week is uh, our new regular Thomas Benavides. Hello. And James Kellys. Hello, everyone. And so yesterday was the um, Tenants' Rights Ordinance Citizen Input Hearing. Um, we uh, are going to talk a little bit about it, um, and then we're going to put more of it online. Uh, but Tom is going to talk uh, more about that. So please, Tom. So just as a refresher, the Housing Rights Certification Ordinance is a proposed law for that's currently going through City Council. It was drafted largely by Watch CDC. It was brought forward uh, to the City Council after like a year of watch advocacy by Jonathan Paz uh, last earlier this month, alongside Colleen Bradley MacArthur and George Darcy. And what this law does is that it requires that anytime someone starts a lease and 30 days before anyone is evicted from their home, whether it's an owner-occupied home being foreclosed upon or uh, being evicted from your rental, uh, it is required that either their foreclosing agent or your landlord provides you with a one-page fact sheet, which lists all your rights and resources that are available to you. Um, yeah, and this list of rights and resources is provided by the city the city and local nonprofits. So no effort on the part of the landlord beyond just handing them these, this piece of paper. Massive amount of attendance at the citizen input hearing. Um, the government center auditorium was genuinely overflowing. I was stuck outside for half of it. Uh, and you can watch it online, both on WACAC's government meetings page, as well as on our YouTube channel under the live streams. Uh, but you see there are a lot of people and a lot of people there who were there to talk about it. A lot of people in favor of the ordinance and also a lot of people opposed who are pretty much entirely landlords. And also, interestingly, all the people against didn't really seem to understand what this law did. Um, there were a lot of complaints about how this law is implementing rent control. Uh, this tenant's rights certification ordinance has nothing to do with rent control. There was a lot of worries about how this ordinance would delay evictions or enable the non-payment of rent by tenants. There is one dude who he spent like his full five, full five minutes of talking, talking about how it's outrageous that the city council would be allowed to enforce the non-payment of rent and force landlords to provide rental housing for free. Um, that simply is not true. The reason that's seemed outrageous is because it was entirely fabricated and made up. There are multiple people who are complaining about how the local government has no business getting in to the, like getting in the way of the tenant landlord relationship, which is also kind of ridiculous. The entire premise of a tenant landlord relationship is that it is a legal document, which is bound and enforced by our legal system and government. Uh, but regardless, it was largely just a lot of misinformation on that side. I didn't hear a lot of genuine arguments that were against it beyond just like, I guess there were a few people who were like very simply like, I don't want to go through the eviction process. I want to be able to take someone out. I think two of the big comments that really just like weren't very pleasant was um, like beyond just like the factual inaccuracies. I'm sorry, this is just going to be me dishing on like the anti- ordinance folks but this generally is just like such a bare minimum ordinance but then everyone was worried about like you know i don't want to deal with renters who don't pay rent and being forced to keep them so it should be clarified the purpose of this law is that prior to eviction tenants will be handed this one page fact sheet 
that lists their rights and resources. So that way they know who to reach out to. So that way they can get rental assistance from organizations such as WAPCEC who have the money to provide rental assistance so that these renters can make their rent rental payments and avoid the eviction process altogether. This ordinance is how tenants pay their rent. This is how landlords get their money is if this ordinance is passed, you know that your tenant will have access to all the resources available to them so that they can pay their rent. This is like the primary focus of this law. This law is not something that will enable the non-payment of rent. It is something that will put money that is avail currently available, just people don't know about it, into the pockets of renters so that they can pay their landlord so that way they can continue renting and not have to be evicted. I thought, yeah, I thought that was particularly hilarious. Like so many comments about, well, how am I going to pay my mortgage? This notification is how you pay your mortgage. It is how you acquire the money to pay the mortgage. The money that the renter gets resources to pay your mortgage. And also I thought it was, I thought it was completely hilarious how transparent a few of them were saying that the renter paid their entire mortgage. And so literally just spelling out how much of a leech they are to the renter paying the mortgage, keeping all of the equity uh, while the renter gets none. Yeah, there was a total lack of self-awareness and just like how power is balanced between a landlord and tenant. There was that sort of discussion where they were complaining about, they were saying how they, they were financing a rent a renter's living as if the renter wasn't paying for their mortgage. Um, there was also one really tone deaf dude who was saying, yeah, homelessness is bad, but bankruptcy is worse, which is an insane statement to say. Like it is, if you have to choose between losing the only home you live in as a renter who gets evicted or losing a second home off to the side that is like just, you know, an extra income source for you, losing the home you live in is worse. Yeah. Like... If you lose an income source, there are always ways to get other jobs, get money. If you lose your house and become homeless, that is like an infamously horrible hole to get out of. And I forget who brought it up in the meeting, but it's important to bring up, yeah, like, you know, the average cost once someone becomes chronically homeless to like get out of that rut or even just like maintain that, the cost to the, to the city and local and state and federal governments is like $40,000 per person because it is expensive to be homeless. It does horrible damage to your health. That requires, mental, uh, that requires health care uh, and hospital visit requires a lot of policing because the way we deal with unhoused people is fucked up in this uh, country. Um, like by far, <laughs> there are a few things worse than becoming homeless. Like it is genuinely a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, much more difficult than, you know, losing a second home, you know. Um, and then also there was just a bunch of, you know, um, racial undertones we shall say um the, the first person who got up there was saying why can't we just teach everyone english <laughs> america was created on responsibility if you really want to help the immigrant teach them english link it to many things but if they can speak english they will have better lives, not a free place to stay. That's how it started. I thought, I thought that was hilarious because Watch has a bunch of like ESL uh, classes. It's like, why can't you just do the thing you already do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, if only they had a one page fact sheet that told them where they could learn English. Not that that should be a prerequisite to them deserving housing, but like, if only there was a one-page fact sheet that they were provided that taught them where to learn their English. That was also this thing with this other landlord who came up who was, who was saying, we don't need this ordinance because there are already so many resources out there to help tenants. And she listed off like more organizations than I knew about, um, like local and statewide rental uh, assistance organizations. I'm like, man, I've been advocating this for this law forever and I haven't heard of half these organizations. You know, it would be really cool if we put all these organizations on a single fact sheet and provided them to every renter so that way they knew they had access to these. Um, like, cause that was the main thing. Like all of the land, almost all the landlords who got up and spoke against this ordinance 
they wanted what this ordinance provided. They just genuinely, none of them bothered, very few of them bothered to read what the ordinance did. Um, yeah. And some, and some, yeah, some were very transparent about it. They, some were very transparent that, you know, this is just, they didn't want to put any more power in the hands of renters, even if it meant paying their mortgage. It, they would prefer to deal with the hardships of having to pay their mortgage than, than ever once putting a little bit more power in the hands of renters or even the illusion of power, because this isn't really power at all. This is just literally information. The, <laughs> the, the, the chance that it might, because they don't, they didn't even understand what it was. The chance that it might put a little more power in the hands of renters. That was enough for them. They, they would rather, they would rather go bankrupt. Yeah, the facts of the matter didn't um, matter. These people were complaining about rent control. This could have been an ordinance to implement rent control <laughs> in the city of Waltham, and it would have been the same exact response. Yeah. Um, it would have been cool if it was. Actual <laughs> material realities of this ordinance did not matter to them. It was just like, oh, renters maybe being informed of their current rights that tips the power balance no it's basically well, and basically we're giving out rent for free there there were at least a couple landlords out of the bunch that were saying this is like such a nothing ordinance how are you all not how are you all up in arms about it which was fascinating to see also and mm -hmm. And all the other landlords came up here, they're either lying to you, they have something to hide, or they're freaking lazy. And their laziness borders on negligence for their job. Imagine if I showed up to work tomorrow and was like, oh hey boss, I'm sorry, but I don't, I can't print out a piece of paper and hand it to someone. Do you think you wouldn't get fired that very second? Do you? I don't think so. And so I'm here today in loud support of the housing rights notification law as a landlord in an owner-occupied unit in Waltham. And I encourage all of you city councilors to vote for this ordinance. And I've been to a fair amount of public input sessions and this one had was by far the most attended. And it's the only one I've seen where they had so many people that they had like a tally of the people in attendance before even most of the testimony was done and the way that it played out was basically like an entire family reunion of all these landlords filing into the auditorium to get counted and then filing out and then all the people who had actual experience dealing with the landlords having to wait to then give their testimony after that which is go, sort of tells a lot about how city government operates and when this gets filed probably with prejudice well that's probably gonna be the conclusion of it i don't know is that what you think's gonna happen if i had to guess yeah what do you think that's what they're gonna be pushing to do i genuinely have no idea i i am vaguely hopeful um, i if i were to if i were to guess it would be that this will pass because it's such a small ask and then it will prevent any upward mobility of anything else anything else is going to be shut down because oh we already did the tenants rights thing like like we we hear you we you know here's what here's how to prove that you know we care about this issue but this other issue is one that actually puts hands uh puts power in the hands of uh, uh renters and marginalized groups that's not going to happen that will never happen that is my guess i think it's i think it will at least go to a vote i don't know how it will go i think it'll at least go to a vote just because like even barring the landlords and their families like filing and filing out, it still might have been the most attended like public input session I've ever seen. Uh, mm, just absolutely. like this is an incredibly like well publicized and well reached um, like ordinance. I feel like it's very like broadly communicated, like how bare bones and simple and like reasonable this ordinance is. Uh, and I think the city councilors do kind of know that and beyond like the small class of landlords in, in Waltham who are like, you know, reactionary, like knee jerk against any semblance of like tenants having rights. Um, I, I feel like literally every other person in the city would be like, oh, this is kind of reasonable and it may like turn them sour. That's just me like being optimistic though. Maybe that's not actually how people work, but. Yeah, I mean, if they filed it, I mean, I wouldn't be super surprised at all. Um, I, was, I would say I am surprised at how many people are there, um, and especially the opposition. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's, you know, I was just naive over people's ability to read a document, but it was, I was, I was surprised, 100%.
what I think that would be interesting to see is a, a final tally of like the people who actually gave testimony versus just had their hands counted because like it, it, it's very easy to get people to show up to get their hands counted. It's a bigger lift to have people putting their names down and stuff. And that's how a lot of these meetings tend to be operated is creating like a hurdle for people to even show up to the thing. And asking people to put identifying information that could then get them discriminated against for housing in the future is an even bigger ask. And I think the people definitely deserve to be heard out. And mm -hmm. I think it'd be a shame to have the weight of those people getting their family members to all show up and get voted or get counted as representative for what should be a very small ask and should get done. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be disappointing when it happens, I think. But again, we can't telling about what the this. city council does. <laughs> we can't even yeah. pass this. That's, that's just insane. Of course, it is an election year, so you got to think about that. So that might be part of the reason why people file it. But man, if we cannot even pass this. What? What is? And to be clear, like this was originally submitted like over a year ago. Yeah, that's true. Fair point. Fair point. Was was picked up briefly as the resolution. Then we had we had that we we covered that earlier in the year, and this this is it getting picked up as an ordinance, mm -hmm. and an ordinance that doesn't need a public hearing. And honestly, it's so like it's so like minor and undemanding that it shouldn't need a public hearing either. Yeah, that's that's something important to talk about. Someone was asking me like, I don't understand. Like they voted on it like at the meeting. Like is that it? Um, I should they, they were confused. Um, like what happens after this? It should be stated that this is a citizen input hearing called, but it's not necessary to do it. It's just like an additional thing. And it all really stems from Kathy and Harris uh, back in ordinance and rules. I don't think we need to rehash of exactly why. Um, but this no, I think is just we should like definitely rehash that this is her pulling, trying to make, basically make it clear who the silent majority is that is making this, make this, makes this too much to ask of her as the chair of ordinance and rules. To yeah, um, Tom, do you wanna, do you wanna, do a quick timeline of this? Yeah, sure. So over a year ago, Watt CDC said like, hey, this is a very simple ordinance. We should try to do this in Waltham. Uh, they kept on talking about it and like working on it in the background, but no city councilors picked it up. Uh, until last December, Jonathan Paz kind of like dipped his toe in by doing like a housing renters and landlords resolution, just like explore the concept. Um, even though like in housing rights notification ordinance had already been drafted by Watch. And then fast forward a few months, last, it was either last March or April, there was the Ordinance and Rules Committee where this resolution was finally discussed. And Jonathan Paz was like, hey, okay, so in the background, uh, Watch CDC has actually drafted something that falls within the bounds of this resolution, something called the Housing Tenants Rights Notification Ordinance is what Watch called it. This seems pretty cool, pretty reasonable. Uh, I'd like to have this talked about, um, brought to the council. Uh, so he, there was some back and forth in ordinance and rules where ordinance and rules, the committee members, let Jonathan Paz talk as an off committee counselor. And then Jonathan Paz said, hey, watch CDC, who's been showing up to every city council meeting for the past few months. Um, they are here uh, and they drafted this ordinance. Can one of them, can we have one of them talk just to like elaborate on what this ordinance would do? Um, and Kathy, Kathy Ann Harris said, no, there is not support for that on this counts on this committee. Uh, go have a citizen input hearing for it, um, which is totally unnecessary because any city council or any committee can hear from off committee members. Um, it happens all the time with lawyers in ordinance and rules specifically. You know, pretty much any time you look at an ordinance and rules meeting, you'll be, hear them say, "Let's hear from an off committee member, uh, lawyer for this company that has something in front of us." Let's hear from you. Um, there is nothing in the city council rules that I'm aware of, and they have never presented anything in the city council rules that say that they can't do that for a non-lawyer. You know, the reason it didn't happen is because Kathy Ann Harris said, I don't want to listen uh, to the person who helped design this ordinance. Uh, but here's a delay tactic. Why don't you do a whole citizen input hearing for it? Uh, and that kind of just snowballed. Um, did that necessarily determine that this is the course we would take? No, but that's what caused it to turn out like this. 
and now there's a citizen input hearing that just happened, but like that's not the necessary part of the process. Uh, and so, you know, it still needs to go through the motions of a, of a, of an ordinance, uh, in city council. And at the end of this, uh, input hearing, it was moved to ordinance and rules. Um, and so it will be talked about in two weeks because the full city council is happening on Monday. Is that correct? Am I am I right in that? I believe, I believe we're hit, hitting the so um, we're having council committee council next oh, week. Oh yes, then, it's the last. Then it's, it's the, the summer meeting. session. I forgot. So, okay, so, so this it's is going to be delayed like, longer, regardless. Like, well, that? Yes. That's, it's going to be delayed longer yes. until like the fall, regardless. Let's see. well, you know, it can. It also possible that it's not because council committee council it allows for very specific. Uh, expediency uh for a lot of these things and some counselors use it for nefarious purposes a lot of these committees don't get recorded because it goes council committee council so local access doesn't really have time to like jump around and so there there's definitely been uh cases where things were either passed or not passed uh during a council committee council uh because of the expediency of it um and it depends on who's there and who's not. It's very interesting. So probably it'll just be delayed till September. Um, and maybe even longer to get a, get get past the election. Maybe that's how some, some counselors will think. But totally, I could see it being filed uh, on Monday, um, if that's what they were going to do. I forgot it was council committee council. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's uh, in summary basically all of it um as was mentioned by james as well there were a few landlords who did read the ordinance were like hey this is very undemanding and spoke in favor of it that was really cool uh but if you want to watch the whole thing it is both on this youtube channel under the live streams we'll probably be clipping more of it in the near future and then also it's available currently on the wcac uh government meetings website yes yeah, so stay tuned on our youtube channel for more clips from that meeting um and other content from that um okay we're gonna talk a little bit about where we're at with the elections um so uh i'm gonna throw up a image that we were working on um in the last couple of minutes i made some quick edits because i'm not the owner of this so um so right now uh people still have until june 30th to pull papers and submit 50 signatures. So this still might look different. And in fact, I haven't looked at the uh, the city clerk's piece of paper in a week, so it might already be different and you're just getting that information. Um, but as of right now, this is all the information we have um, over who has pulled papers. Now, uh, I have a list up for people that are uh, just listening to this, but I'm going to read most of it um, and talk a little bit about the candidates um, mm -hmm. and then give my take on uh, uh specifically the ward three race as well as the at large race um and a little bit about the timeline i guess um and so for the mayoral race you know that there are three candidates um paz uh jeanette mccarthy the incumbent and then there's also the uh first time candidate uh Dwayne champagne that no one really knows anything about um we had a we i had a phone call with the person um when he pulled papers, uh, I mean, I, and I know that he's knocking on doors, um, and so I'm pretty confident that he's going to um, he's going to submit signatures. So there will be a preliminary. Um, we'll talk a little bit about preliminaries uh, later. Um, in, uh, in wards one and two, uh, there is no opponent. Uh, the incumbents have pulled papers. Um, I really wish someone would pull in ward one. Please, someone pull papers in ward one. Um, in ward three, uh, right now. Um, there's Bill Hanley, who uh, ran in Ward 2. He sits on the health department. Um, he watches our show. Uh, there's Paul Tracy, um, retired cop who pulled papers to run against George last election. He almost won. Um, he's, his claim to fame is that he was a cop that uh, Paul Brasco once uh, used to help kick out a tenant. And uh he lost his job i think or was suspended i think he lost his job and then he sued the city uh he won the case um and uh was put on back on the force and then retired um 
And uh, if that seems like an outrageous story and like, why would anyone vote for him? Like I said, he's already done this and he's already pulled papers and he did very well. And so uh, no one gives a shit about that for some reason. Um, and then there's a uh, third new candidate, um, Barbara Ayala. Um, George Darcy, the Ward 3 incumbent, uh, made it known that while he pulled papers to run in Ward 3, he recently made the decision to run at large. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, no one's pulling papers in Wards 4, 5, or 6. John McLaughlin, Joey LaCava, Sean Durkee, they all don't have opponents. Would love to see all three of them challenged, some more than others. Um, in Ward 7, uh, there is a contend and contention uh, with the incumbent Paul Cates uh, with someone named Robert Davis. Um, I know nothing about him. Uh, no one I know knows anything about him. He declined an interview um, at the clerk's office when we were interviewing uh, people that had pulled papers. Um, uh, if I can butt in, um, yeah. this isn't on this page, but did I hear correctly that actually someone associated with Waltham Field Community Farm John Tracy is running in Ward Four against. John oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. He he did pull papers. This is um this is bad. Yeah, this is outdated information that I just forgot. Yeah, John Tracy is is pull papers to run uh, in Ward Four against John McLaughlin. That was such a uh, hiccup there. Thank you for correcting me there. Um, I actually don't know John Tracy personally. Uh, some of my friends know John Tracy. He's been on um, uh, he's been very active in some of the nonprofits in the city. Um, I think people that are friends with me are going to like John Tracy. I really uh, could do without John McLaughlin. I think uh, he's, you know, I think he, John McLaughlin's an interesting person because he doesn't rock the boat in, in the city council. I wouldn't say he's as vocal as other people. I wouldn't say he's vocal as most people, uh, but he's, he's um, elected time and time again. And so I believe that he is good at constituent feedback. I'm not in Ward 4. Um, I don't do Ward 4 things, so I don't know that to be true. Um, but I mean, you know, we can't just look at this only from like what people do in the city council because there's there's more to what to to the job of city councilor than just like doing things in the city council. It's also about being being responsive um, and getting back to people and uh, being active in your community, holding meetings. Um, I don't think actually John holds many meetings, but he's got to do something. He's got to be doing something right for him to keep getting elected all the time. So that's what I, that, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to be fair. Um, in my in my critiques here, uh, but John Tracy is, has pull papers to run against him, so there will be a contention there. Yeah. Um, so and and no relation to Paul Tracy. No relation to Paul Tracy. Um, you'll see that a lot um, in Waltham. Uh, also related to Paul Tracy, uh, we should play the clip from the uh, community input session here for that one. Oh yeah, yeah. We forgot to mention a um, uh, friend of the show, Daniel Sari's comments uh, at the citizen input hearing. Uh, but it's actually more poignant to include them here uh, because he talks about Paul Tracy. So, yeah, we voted Paul Brasco out. Mr. Sari, please stick with the topic. The topic at hand is eviction notices, and this is regards to eviction. An eviction by a bad actor and the Los PD. And this has a racial component, and we should be aware of that. This has a racial component where the white homeowning population of Waltham wants to be able to treat their tenants however they want without any kind of pushback. So in Ward 8, uh, Channel 781 News member friend uh, Chris Hammer has pulled paper throwing against uh, Kathy Ann Harris. I'm very excited to see that. Um, in Ward 9, with, uh, with Jonathan Paz um, running for mayor, his seat will be open. We have Eamon Dawes, uh, a friend of the show, been on several times, um, and Robert Logan, who held the seat for, I think, 30 years, probably probably a little less than that, um, before. I uh, said he was never going to run again, but why wouldn't he? Uh, I wouldn't say he has all the advantages of being the incumbent, uh, but he has most of the advantages of being an incumbent. I would say pretty much de facto in incumbent. Um, for school committee, you have all three incumbents that are full papers. Uh, and then you have um, two uh, uh, first-time candidates, um, Tammy. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. I apologize, Tammy. 
for not doing that, um, as well as uh, James Zangy. Um, I learned recently, I didn't know anything about James, uh, uh, that he is Tom Stanley's, one of Tom Stanley's aides. Um, he's also very young, I think he's like 25. Um, but as soon as I heard that he was Tom Stanley's aide, he's completely dead to me. Um, and so I have, I have no opinion other than that. Um, uh, I have friends that say Tammy is a good person. I don't know much about Tammy. I think they have a child in the dual language school, but I'm probably just going to vote for Tammy based on very little information um, until new information surfaces. I believe she lives up the street from me. I'm definitely voting for her. Cool. Um, okay. And then at large, uh, here's where I'm going to talk a little bit more. Um, at large, you've got all the people that have pulled uh, that are comments that have pulled papers. You also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have seven new people that have pulled papers. What that means is that there's going to be a preliminary at large. Um, so as of right now, there's going to be preliminary for the mayoral race and the at large race. So there's going to be um, a preliminary in every ward. For either one of them, if either one of them had happened. Um, so uh, in September, uh, the mayoral um, race and the at large race are going to dwindle by one, by one. <laughs> so everyone's going to vote. You are all going to get a standing for where we're at. Um, and then one person from each, the mayoral and the at large, is going to get knocked off by one. Um, and of course, it should be said that that's if all these people submit signatures. Um, I know most of these people, um, and so I'm feeling pretty confident. The only person I know absolutely nothing about um, is Susan uh, Rosenfelder, um, my fellow uh, Jewish uh, comrade. Uh, but Susan, please submit signatures uh, wherever you are. Um, and so uh, George Darcy pulled papers to run at large. Uh, this is big news. Um, I might I might make a list really quick, but maybe not. Um, George Darcy has uh, represented Ward 3 for a very long time. Um, I think besides, I think it's, it goes Kathleen at 40 years. I think Tom Stanley has George beat by one term, and then it's George Darcy. So uh, George Darcy has been on the city council for a very long time in Ward 3. Uh, and um, I think it's I think it's kind of clear why he decided to pull paper, uh, pull, uh, to switch to at-large. What he's saying is that he thinks he can serve the community better at-large. I think his DUI uh, is, has, a, has a large part to do with that. You know, I'm a big fan of George Darcy, um, but I'm going to be very transparent about that. I think that definitely has most of what to do with that um, because it's very, uh, I mean, I, I've been telling people since as soon as it happened, it would be so easy if I lived in Ward 3. I didn't have to be a candidate. If I didn't like War, if I didn't like George and I lived in Ward 3, I would plaster every telephone poll with flyers about George's DUI. It would be so easy. It would just, it would, I would, it would just, um, and so I always assumed that he was going to uh, lose. It'd be, a, I think, it would be a close race. I assumed he was going to lose in Ward Three, which would be sad. He decided to switch at large, um, and so that does uh, that does many things in Ward Three. It's going to be a conservative stronghold. Uh, most of North Waltham is going to be controlled uh, by very conservative people. Um, how do I? What, what do I mean when I say that? Ward Three is the most conservative ward if you are judging it based on Elizabeth Warren's run in 2018 and the yes on four data, uh, which was the transgender question, um, which I did a lot of work for uh, doing phone banks and things like that. Um, based on the data from those two things, Ward 3 is the most conservative ward in all things. Um, and the second most conservative ward is Ward 1. And like half of Waltham, because of density, uh, is those two wards? Um, I wouldn't say half, but it's 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 less dense, so it's bigger. It's it's very big um, geographically. It's a large part of Waltham. Yes, I but think by, that's by surface idea. area. Yeah, um, and so most uh, like a lot of Waltham is now just going to be controlled by Anthony Fauci, who is blazing in his conservatism, um, and either 
Bill Hanley or Paul Tracy, both pretty blazing in their conservatism. Um, uh, yeah, Ayala, and I'll get to that. Uh, Ayala, I, I've met a couple times already. Uh, we, we chatted. I really like Ayala. Uh, uphill battle for Ayala. Uh, uphill battle. I bet George and Dorsey, sir. Um, I bet a lot of our friends uh, uh, do that, but it's just it's just a very very conservative board. Um, I think the people of Ward Three keep voting George in because George is born and bred in Waltham, um, and they he has a way of speaking to people uh, that doesn't let his national views. I think he's a Green Party member, a uh, voting Green Party member, um, but he talks to Ward Three in a way that uh, just allows him to be voted on um, again and again. Uh, so I uh, love you, uh, you know, hoping your campaign's good. I'm sure you can bring a lot of good issues. Winning is not, is not the only thing, um, uh, but uphill battle for sure. So very sad about Ward 3. It's about to get worse, I think. Um, so at large, this also uh, is bad for the at large uh, non-incumbents. The only good thing about George doing this is that George will remain on the city council. Because George, like I said, very popular. He does well in Ward 3, the most conservative ward in Waltham. He's going to do great in every other ward. Um, I think he immediately walks into the at-large seats. I don't think he's going to have a problem at all. I think he'll be near the top with very little campaign, which historically he has not done very much of. <laughs> um, and so what that means, you know, most of the time when you're running at large, you're vying, uh, you're vying with all the non-incumbents for one spot. You're voting for, you're all gunning for the bottom of the barrel. Um, and you just hope that the the least vote getting person gets knocked off and you are that person that gets on there. Um, and so with George pretty much walking in, of course, you know, I could eat my words and he could, he could not, he could, he could lose. Um, but that's, that, this is just me guessing. Um, uh, so that bottom spot, which is also held by Colleen Bradley McCarthy, uh, mm -hmm. should, should be said is now no longer up for grabs. It is now like, you're now to have to work twice as hard because you're going for that number two spot, um, who who hopefully is Colleen. Um, and so you're really hoping for number three. And so that's almost impossible as a non-incumbent. Um, and so, and so all of these, all of our friends here, the Emily Superior, Emma Zumas, um, everyone else, they're all like they just their chances of getting elected now become much much smaller. Um, does do you guys have thoughts about that? That's just me talking. Like you, who who knows if that's true? I think it's going to be interesting to see what the turnout actually ends up being for this. It's probably going to be extremely low, but that also doesn't necessarily um, hurt people in that kind of way because it's going to be a specific amount of people that are tuned into things. I think that are me turning out for that yeah all so. things are possible so yeah yeah with the low turnout if you mobilize people you're gonna win if you work really goddamn hard you're gonna win um but how hard is it for non-incumbents to go for that number two spot it's gonna be pretty hard i would love if uh people realized how bad of city councilors carlos vidal and patrick o'brien are who are at the bottom of the barrel um and then get swapped for someone who uh is better but it's so hard and that's why that's why george you know, I'm talking about the anecdote of uh, firing uh, telephone poles uh, against George Darcy. Um, it, he becomes much less vulnerable running at large because it's so hard to target people at large. You know, we, we talk about some of the worst people in city council being at large. You know, why don't we just target them? Because we need we would need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to target anyone at large. It would take so much time and energy because every single person can vote for them. And so um, if you're if you're not running in a ward race, if you're running at large or it's something that requires the entire city to vote for you, it's incredibly hard to go negative against that person because it requires so much more resources um, than just targeting the people that live in the ward. And so George, much less vulnerable to that kind of criticism, um, although I wouldn't be surprised if I start seeing it still. Um, and so people have until June 30th to uh, pull papers and submit 50 signatures, and then the election season starts. People are already um, knocking on doors. You might you might have uh, already had candidates knocking on doors. I'm interested in all the literature. I'm interested in the talking points. I'm interested to see debates. Um, and 
stay tuned for preliminaries in September instead of November. So we'll have a good sense for at large and the mayoral race um, going into uh, November. Moving on, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the budget. Um, the city council uh, budget was approved um, a couple of days ago, and uh, the follow uh, before that they had budget hearings um, for most of the departments and uh, places that the city spends money, um, and we've uploaded a few of those online. Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about one of them, um, but James, can you tell us more about that? I'm going to talk about a few different parts of the budget hearings process. There's a special city council meeting where they voted the approval of the budget in total for the uh, municipal schools uh, tr or parking. Uh, and, and long and short of it is that uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur and Paz voted against this, but first provided reasonings for why they voted against the budget. So they reiterated uh, respect for the work done preparing it and the time invested in doing it, but expressed concerns with the priorities and urgencies and, and the initiatives sort of being shown, uh, the need for looking forward or more forward looking infrastructure, such as bike pedestrian infrastructure, affordable housing, and just better planning for the future. Uh, and there was then pushback from some of the other city councilors and we had just talked about like O'Brien uh, in particular pushing back on like, how, how dare you, this is, this is something that you can't, that you can't just not vote on, which reflects the sort of, is, is definitely going to be, they're going to be getting dragged for not, for voting no on this. So uh, anyway, the budget was passed after all that and the world moves on. Uh, Part two of this is going to a, uh, we're going to play a clip of Colleen talking about this, uh, talking about the budget here. Fortunately, I couldn't be in person, but to sit through and listen to uh, the hours of work that uh, my fellow counselors on the finance committee did and members of our various city departments, and I am very grateful for that. In the two uh, sessions, budget sessions that I've been a part of, uh, something keeps standing out to me, and that is that we did a net cre increase this year uh, of 5%, and I'm happy with that. However, it feels really incremental. As someone who's lived in the city for 14 years now, a 5% increase in times where we have seen tremendous growth in this city uh, just feels a little bit status quo. It feels a little bit not forward thinking. I could think of um, a lot of different uses for the $8 million uh, that were cut from the budget, uh, specifically um, when constituents ask me, why can't we have nice things? Um, and I'll put under that um, municipal composting, blue bikes, bus shelters, bike lanes, protected bike lanes, um, and affordable housing. Um, and affordable housing, that last one, is not a nice to have. Um, I think some of the things I just mentioned are nice to haves, but I don't uh, consider something like affordable housing uh, a nice to have. And I listen to the testimony, and I listen to the questions, and it just struck me that there was a lot of blame put back on the state and that this municipality is not responsible for creating affordable housing. And I feel like there's a half truth in there because if we were willing to do the things and meet the criteria to apply for these grants through the state, I assure you money would come in. And I think we're, we're not playing the right game uh, when it comes to affordable housing. And certainly that $8 million um, could have been spent uh, in other ways. So I will be voting no. And I want to also say that it's not a reflection of the work uh, that everyone has done. But uh, it just feels very status quo and not forward thinking. Thank you. Part two of this is uh, Vidal pushing for meetings in person on behalf of the mayor. And now, why are you still meeting via Zoom? Well, While most of our commissions and boards and this body itself, we're meeting in person now. I think you and the 
Conservation Commission on the only, for some reason, uh, the I organization. I believe the CPC is also. Yeah, meeting the CPC, you're right. I did talk to on, on Cons Zoom. Uh, Mr. Barrett and, yesterday. And, and the, the reason is, is uh, well, there are a number of reasons. I think we mentioned this last time. That, that uh, first of all, that room uh, in the basement mm -hmm. where we meet uh, is very closed. And so uh, it's not well ventilated. Um, and it has a much higher uh, potential well, for transmittal of, of, come on, you know of what? COVID, you mean? COVID, Oh, yes. COVID, I, I wasn't sure. I, 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 I wasn't <laughs> so, sure what you were referring to because you guys met there before COVID happened, correct? Yes, we met there before okay. COVID happened. Are you looking yeah. for a new place to however, meet? However, let, let, let me say that, that there are advantages to meeting on Zoom, especially for a commission like the Historical Commission. There's documentation which the members need to see and the public needs to see and it's much easier to see that on zoom when you're sharing documents on zoom than it is before people would come into the room and, and a developer would put some kind of board up at the front of the room and people couldn't see mm -hmm. in fact it's impossible to have it angled so both the commission can see it and the public can see it whereas this way everybody can see the documentation so so there are some advantages to, to working on zoom so in this clip, a uh, representative of the Historical Commission was being questioned in the budget hearing as a part of this process that was just sort of being talked about earlier. Why the Historical Commission, the Conservation Commission, and the Community Preservation Commission were not having meetings in person and instead of having them on Zoom. Uh, that all pressed on the need to return to in-person because of a sort of vague indication towards the independent, the importance of body language and sort of general ritual of showing up to city council. Uh, they, they, they prefer to have the meetings remotely because it makes it easier to attend, uh, safer to participate in, and easier to publicize. And this is also reflected in the, uh, I believe, the CPC meeting where they had talked about how this made it easier for engineers to attend because there are a lot of different meetings all over the state. state. Uh, one of the things that I thought was particularly interesting was the part where Vidal sort of appeared to relish feigning ignorance about the concerns from COVID. Uh, when he's yeah, what? Saying, what, yeah. what what concerns? You know, you know what? Oh my uh, God. It clearly didn't clearly did not think that they were legitimate concerns, and I think that it's also really telling that was yeah, it was almost of that. like villainous, like the way he was talking. When we we talk about this on the show, and Josh speaks very well to this, um, but two years ago, uh, the, the city council was almost completely inaccessible to most people because most of the committees were unrecorded um and uh you had to physically go to city council uh to to really understand what was going on um and so uh through the work of of uh people here um as well as some people not here uh most of the committees now are recorded um, and that's great for accessibility uh during covid almost everything was not only uh online but it was live um, and so it was very accessible for most people to just tune in. Um, of course, it wasn't completely accessible and we're working towards that as well. Um, but uh, during COVID, like it was undeniably more accessible for people to interact with their local government uh, to understand what was going on better. Um, and so while, it's, while these committees uh, bring up legitimate concerns, uh, Carlos Vidal is completely dismissive. Uh, what's funny about the clip is him talking about the need to address body language, but his body language was awful during that whole, during the whole uh, committee. It was completely dismissive and passive aggressive uh, towards the historical commission. Um, and uh, it's just gross. And so. Um, just another example of one of these terrible at large city councilors that's got to go. For real. Um, and, and and just just to be clear, nobody has to meet in person. Uh, Carlos Vidal didn't even give a great great reason why either. It was just saying, like, this is the way things go. I just want it to be done that way. Uh, plenty of cities still have many committees online. Um, and there's nothing stopping anyone from meeting online. There's nothing, there's no, nothing like, just because Carlos Vidal wants to play dress up and just go through the motions of city council, just because he like values the the showmanship of of city government um the way things used to be um which is literally conservatism um like we don't have to do that they don't have to meet in person um and so 
demanding it. And it also serves weird take, it, weird take. Well, it's not that weird because it serves the purpose of making city government more difficult for people to navigate if they're not like a business or in some way related to landlording. Or an engineer, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Also, it would be added that like, well, well, Carlos Fidal didn't give a good reason for it to be brought in person, like beyond the accessibility and like the worries about like COVID. Um, the person responding to it all did have a very good reason, which is just the practicality of nowadays, if you sit through like an in-person meeting, like, you know, they have like these huge poster boards that they're setting up on easels or like just stands. And like, it's so hard to see they're pointing to it. And like, if you're in like the right side of the audience, you can't see it. I'm pretty sure half the council can't see like all the graphics either. In Zoom, it's just a screen share. And that genuinely is so much easier for understanding mm -hmm. anything that involves maps or diagrams, which comes up a lot in like board of survey and planning, any mm -hmm. sort of project that's getting permitted. Lots of stuff in historical society, lots of stuff in conservation commission because they're working with like maps of the land. Like it is genuinely like so much more convenient and it's almost comical, like the inefficiency of any time they have to do it in person, setting up on these like ridiculous, like little big board, like these big boards facing one half of the audience point of stuff when it could just be like, I mean, either like install like a projector in the city council or just like host it on Zoom and screen share. It is so much more convenient. Um, well, so the documents that the accessibility. Also, the documents that they're getting shown are like never made like accessible to anyone who goes in person to these things. I've That's been to true. so many of these meetings at like city council or whatever, where they're just leafing through these like stacks of documents and, and referencing them. And you have no frame of reference as a person watching it or whatever, because it's it's not in the agenda. It's not in the docket. It's not even necessarily made clear in what part of the e-docket it's in at that point. So it's just like. They, they were talking about putting getting screens set up in the city council for people to be able to follow along with, but all these problems would be solved if they were just being held online. So mm -hmm. that was that was the bit on the some of the the, the on the budget hearing. Yeah, but there we posted a couple other clips online that we found interesting. We might do a little more on the uh, budget as well, um, but we felt like that particular exchange was particularly egregious. Yeah, and also relate. We should talk a bit about the uh, voting against the budget because they uh, that that taken out of context is definitely going to get them some heat, like both Paz and and Colleen Bradley MacArthur. I thought Colleen had a really good uh, uh, re reasoning for why she voted against it, and in particular because like two councillors voting against the budget isn't going to stop this whole thing happening. This is them making a political point that they don't think that the priorities are what they should be. So. I'm ho I wish uh, people felt similarly. Yeah, we'll see. Um, moving on to the MBTA's Communities Act. A couple of weeks ago in the Ordinance and Rules, uh, Attorney Azadi uh, spoke on uh, where we're at with the MBTA's Communities Act. We thought it would be good to talk a little bit about that. Um, and Tom is here to chat about that. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to segue into this just by discussing a bit further, like the reasons for um like voting against the budget why i think that's a good thing which is just because like the government currently is like very emaciated um, a lot of like services aren't being fully funded that colleen pointed out wonderfully in her reasons for voting against one of those things is the planning department which helps to coordinate how like streets and all the different developments in waltham synergize together to become a functioning city uh, and recently we had our head planner retire. Uh, and because of that, like the planning department is so emaciated that we have attorney Azadi who, you know, has no expertise uh, in planning. And she's the first to acknowledge that. Like this isn't a, this isn't a not good cert. Like she knows that she is not a planner and a planner should be doing this. But our planning department is so small for like a whole city of 60,000 plus people that one person retiring and suddenly this huge task of complying with the MBTA Communities Act is shifted to the law department for some goddamn reason. Um, so that's a bit ridiculous. And that's led to just a lot of like confusion with how the MBTA Communities Act is to be complied with at all. 
Um, which brings us to the city council meeting earlier this month where attorney Zadi was in to talk about like how Waltham can comply with the MBTA Communities Act. And what this law does, it requires that Waltham legalizes around 4,000 homes near transit, half of which has to be within a half mile of a commuter rail station, the other half of which can be anywhere. Um, yeah, and which has to be at a density of at least 15 units per acre. So we just need dense housing near transit. We need to legalize it. That's what this law is. And Azadi was opining on just like, you know, what she's learned and what she's been able to figure out with the law department in the past few months of trying to figure out how Waltham can comply with this law. Um, so I have a couple of things to say about what she said, just like points of clarification. Um, but first I would like to address that something that keeps on coming up is like people, city councilors are not in the NBTA Communities Act for not requiring affordability. And then Azadi keeps on repeating the statement that the Communities Act even limits the amount of affordability that is allowed to be included in new developments with the NBTA Communities Act. It's limited at 10%. This is not totally true. From their webpage, which describes the NBTA Community Act, this document is their guidelines for it. And this outlines the affordability, which is permitted in the MBTA Communities Act, um, which is that within, up, within zoned area for the MBTA Communities Act, all the development can have a maximum of 10% affordability requirements and only a certain degree of affordability. Unless Waltham conducts a study which says like, hey, it can be feasibly built if we create more affordable housing than this, in which case we can go up to 20% affordable with any depth to like how affordable that housing is. So this is just something that keeps on getting left out of the conversation. So I just want to make sure it is included so people know. Currently, Waltham has an, an inclusionary zoning ordinance, which just means for any dense development, 20% of its units will be allowed to be made affordable. This can still be the case after the MBTA Communities Law um, or when we implement the MBTA Communities Law. Whenever we legalize 4,000 units of housing, we will also in turn be legalizing potentially 800 units of affordable housing, which will be massive for affordability in Waltham. That is more affordable housing than Waltham has created in the past like 30 years cumulatively it is a lot of potential affordable housing on the horizon. And the fact that it keeps on getting skipped over and people are saying like, oh no, this, the MBT Communities Act is actually like restricts how much affordable housing can build. It's like strictly false on the service, but also like digging deeper. Like the only requirement is that we do a study that says it's feasibly, feasible to be produced. And, um, you know, if our current inclusionary zoning ordinance isn't feasible, then it's useless anyway. Because uh, that's actually a big problem currently. Um, our cu current inclusionary zoning ordinance allows for 20% of any development to be affordable housing. It has never once been used to create affordable housing in the city of Waltham in the past few years. Um, because, um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Primarily, that is just illegal to build into housing most of Waltham. Uh, but secondarily, we recently discussed a condo development where um, the the developer of the church and the condos chose to just like pay a lump sum instead of doing the affordability requirements just because that's what was feasible for them. So, yeah, that's the first point. Um, secondly, I'd just like to discuss the difficulty of complying with this law because Azadi also says that she has access to modeling software uh, provided by the state, which can like model how we can adjust our zoning codes to comply with the MBTA Communities Act. And she says that she's really struggling to find a way in which Waltham can have 4,000 units of housing close to transit. Um, which, I mean, once again, this is not a, a knock against her. You know, she's probably just learning how to use the software. I don't know how this software works. I'm sure I would, would not use it either. But Waltham currently has 4,000 unit, 4, units of housing close to transit. Um, so here, right, you can see over 2,000 units of housing within a half mile of our commuter rail station um, at a density of greater than 15 units per acre. This is what currently exists in Waltham. 
Um, and then if we just go a little bit wider, we can see that, boom, we have 4,000 units of housing. Um, that is half of which is within a half mile of a commuter rail station and its density is above 15 units per acre. Um, the problem, of course, is that the NBA TA Community Act requires us to legalize housing. And all the housing that currently exists on Southside is illegal to build nowadays because we have dumb zoning laws. Exclusionary zoning laws would be the more accurate term. And everything in Southside was built prior to the 1950s when these zoning laws were created, or at least most of it was. Um, that would be bad. That wouldn't do anything to improve affordability in Waltham. All it would do is make it slightly easier um, for like currently existing housing to be refurbished or like flipped. Like I'm not saying that's what we should do to comp comply with MBTA communities law, but any any time like the city acts like this is like a super onerous thing for the state to require of us, it isn't um, because we already have transit oriented development. It doesn't make Southside a horrible place to live. Southside is wonderful. I love it. It is the beating heart of Waltham. Um, and this is, this. we just have to build more of this to comply with the NBTA Communities Law. Or we just have to legalize more of this to comply with the NBTA Communities Law. It's not like a and, crazy place. And it, and it um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we don't have to build 4,000 units in uh, near transit. We only have to build 2,000 units near transit, and then the other 2,000 units can be built anywhere in Waltham, yeah, or you so know, both, legalized to be zoned in Waltham, those, those units. Yeah, so both by land area and by units of housing legalized, um, at least 50% yeah. of the new zoning has to be within a half mile of commuter rail station, yeah, which so, is what this so, describes. We have like a little over 2,000 of it within a half mile, and then the remaining 2,000 just outside that, yeah. Yeah, so some and, counselors saying, you know, think about what a 3,800 unit uh, building is gonna look like. That's not that's not what this is talking about at all. No, no, not at no, all. They're making it sound like they're gonna have like eight foot build or eight, eight story buildings like everywhere as a result of this. And like, it, it, you, you mentioned that we already have transit oriented development. Like that, this was all, the, like most of this downtown Waltham area was developed as a streetcar suburb. And we should definitely put like the map of that in. Like what that looked like. This is just like requiring them to undo the zoning that they did in the 50s or whatever that made it so that you couldn't build dense housing anymore because you need to have minimum parking and all the extra, all the set setbacks and stuff like that. And yeah, it's. We just need to make Southside legal again. Like Southside has so much <laughs> dense multifamily yeah. housing. It's the most affordable housing that there is in Waltham. And we need more of that dense, affordable housing, uh, which is what the NBJ Communities Act will incentivize us to do. It's, of course, up to Waltham how they can choose to implement this. They can choose to implement it well or they can choose to implement it poorly. Um, but regardless of how well Wal our city council does in implementing this, like it's not an onerous ask. It's just asking us to build more of what we already have or just legalize more of what we already have. One thing related to this that um, I thought was funny was the um, our MBTA Communities Action Plan was accepted by the state. And I think one of the things that was on that action plan was re referring to like the ongoing work that was being done related to like improving the zoning and stuff in the city. And it, in that list was like the master plan and I think the bus shelters. And I noticed that the bus shelters on Moody Street are like in the budget hearings were getting approved and like getting, okay. and that was going to becoming a thing. I can't have, help but wonder if like the MBTA Communities Act sort of lit a fire under the ass of the people to get this stuff done in, in a reasonable time, because it was going nowhere for a while. I think Paz had introduced the Moody Street bus shelter thing years ago. Oh, and yeah, that's the first was, thing he ever did. What was that? And I remember Mick was Mick Miniman was like, ever did. <laughs> yeah, and Mick Miniman was referring to it as like uh, the methadone mile or and, and analogizing it to methadone mile, like, yeah. with, like the thing she would see. And now here we are getting them approved. Yeah, I wish I wish we had our show back then. They would definitely would have been mm -hmm. talking about. Um, yeah. So Tom, just I'm just looking for your prediction. What part of Waltham is going to be uh, affected the most uh, by by this? Do you think it'll be Weston, Warrendale, or uh, Brandis Roberts, or Felton Street? I think those are the four spots. 
What I want to happen is that I would love to just have a bunch of dense housing along Felton Street and all these industrial areas. Like we shouldn't be having heavy polluting industry right in between our densest populated area of Waltham and our most treasured natural resource in the Charles River. We shouldn't have dense, heavy polluting industry right in the middle of those two things. Um, Felton Street should be a nice residential or mixed use corridor. Um, that's a great place to put dense housing. Whenever you add dense housing, next to existing neighborhoods rather than replacing existing neighborhoods you're not displacing anyone and the vast like the great you get the greatest amount of increased housing which will lower rents for everyone else um it'll mean that's lots of dense building which means you get the maximum you get the maximum bang for your buck in, buck in terms of inclusionary zoning you get a lot of income restricted affordable housing out of that i really hope they just build a lot of dense housing along felton street if they just cram it all along there i think that's the best thing um, but that's just my like amateur. I would, yeah. I, I, would. I hope that they, I hope they turn the Brandeis Roberts T station into something more. But I think that's not definitely not going to be in the cards until they get more services out there, like supermarket, at least one supermarket or something. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, just like increase it, like like increasing like the the density along that strip of Felton and even on the other side of the river where Cronin's Landing and on would be nice to see. But like it is like bizarre to have an industrial area persist like this along like such a high value stretch of land, and it really makes you question why that would stay that way if it, unless it was to prevent development for housing, which is really what it looks like. Yeah, and I mean, I, it, McMinimum has been very explicit about that in the past. Actually, McMinimum has been very explicit that like she that was what she hated about the Edison on the Charles, this development right here in the chemistry. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what she hated about. She's like, ah, oh, it should stay industrial, right in between yeah. the Charles River and the densest parts of Waltham. And and the and the bit in the central commuter rail station of the city, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, and like on the subject of like polluting industry stuff in the middle of like residential areas, it's like you've got the um, you know things like all all, the, all this automobile infrastructure stuff like. Um, uh, car washes, uh, mechanics, and all this type of stuff located in this area right here too. That is just like what, what this turns into is like you, you've got this commercial land use of the free public parking spaces that are provided to everyone. And then that's getting used as an excuse to not want more residential people, like more residential use of the land. Yeah, I'm curious uh, because of how most of the city councilors view housing and new housing and their philosophy of housing. I'm curious if they push what they view as bad onto the South side, or if they push it onto Weston or Warrendale, um, which historically has held more affluent um, neighbors. Um, and so I'm very curious to see how it goes. I would guess Brandeis Roberts looks very different, um, but I know very little about all this. Anything else on this, Tom? I guess it is worth saying that like four of our city councilors live in wards, or no, three of our city councilors plus the mayor live in ward seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if that would maybe like mm -hmm. hear a lot of their constituents. I know a lot of their constituents are like not on the South Street side of ward seven. They're, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then just the last two things I wanted to mention about this is uh, Solicitor Azadi also said that a problem with this is that. Um, the city is not allowed to require mixed use development. They aren't allowed to require commercial development in these areas. It has to be where like the only thing that's actually, um, like if someone wants to build only residential, you, should, you the city has to let them build only residential. You aren't allowed to add all these bells and whistles to make it harder to build housing. Uh, so, be, so because of that, whenever uh, there's, she's expressed some concern that like we aren't able to legalize we aren't allowed to mandate that like things like grocery stores are built in these areas. Um, and to that, I just like to say like, A, this is an area where Fulton Street, you're within a 15 minute walk of multiple grocery stores already. Uh, both the ones on Moody Street, uh, the Dispensa Familiar by the Common and also Hannaford. Uh, and also just the fact that like, um, developers will probably build grocery stores if you have 4,000 people right there. Um, there, there keeps on being this like ridiculous assumption that like the reason we don't have like more housing 
or like the reason we don't have affordable housing or the reason we don't have like grocery stores uh, in like certain areas is because that is just like a choice that people make um, just like in the, but it's not a choice. It's something that's enforced by the city council. You know, the city council has made it illegal to build dense affordable housing in most of Waltham. City council has made it illegal uh, to build grocery stores near where people mm. actually live. So that way, you know, it's impossible to walk to a grocery store. Like these aren't choices that people are making. This is something that city council has forced. And once we start allowing people to actually live in more places, um, and if we just, you don't have to force people, to, you don't have to force developers to build a grocery store. If you make it legal for 4,000 people to live in a specific area, there's no way a developer is not going to hop on that money and mm. grab a grocery store. And this isn't me seeing the praises of developers. This is just how the greed works, you know? Yeah. Um, is it morally just? No. But like, you can still just read the TV news and be like, okay, this is how it's going to work. And that's fine. It definitely just makes it look, highlights just how short-sighted a lot of this like posturing against housing has been. Mm-hmm. Like basically bottlenecked a lot of the development that could otherwise be happening here, especially by like not being able to qualify for grants and things like that by not being like, you know, in compliance with like. I was just trying to remember exactly where we are with MBTA's Communities Act, where uh, Tom, do you can you enlighten us on that? Okay, yeah. So with that being said, um, the last thing mentioned in that meeting was that we are just going to set it aside for now um, while I guess they work on more like potential zoning possibilities behind the scene. But I think they floated the idea of having a public input session sometime around the month of September, uh, which is mandatory because anytime you propose zoning changes uh, in a city government, a necessary step for zoning changes is you have to hold a public hearing about it. So that is going to happen. They floated the idea of September. Um, so if that's the case, um, that's probably the next thing will definitely be like organizing around, or at least me as a part of Waltham Inclusive Neighborhoods, will be looking forward to like, A, getting more details on what exact plans they choose to take to um, abide by the MBTA Communities Law, and B, organizing to actually show up and, you know, have our word to say that, yes, Waltham needs more housing. We are in a dire housing shortage right now. Another well-attended meeting for sure. Looking forward to that. Uh, so thank you for that. Thanks for updating us on that. Um, okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of things, or three things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Master Plan Committee. We're going to talk a little bit about private ways and maybe a little bit about the Lexington Solar Farm. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Master Plan Committee. Um, and so if you watch this show, you probably already know um, uh, about the Master Plan Committee. Um, I'm not going to do... A great job at talking about the history of it because we talk at length about that on the show already. Um, but I think at the last end of session debrief, I said that the one of the lows uh, for that for that session was the master plan committee. Um, and so this is a committee that was created in January of 2022, um, and uh, everyone was very curious, like, "Oh, what's the master plan committee going to talk about?" There's, you know, there's very little planning going on um, in Waltham, and this is like a cool opportunity. Like, what are we going to talk about? Um, and I swear to you, for over a year, a year and a half, the only thing that that committee did was do citizen in, uh, with essentially citizen input hearings. I, I think that's the correct word I'm using there. Um, in every single ward. And then they planned to do one for all of Waltham, and that actually got canceled or postponed and never uh, uh, came about. Um, and all of Waltham about what people want to see in Waltham, what would they like to see in the master plan? Um, and those were very fun. Those were very well attended. We had a good time uh, going back and forth there. I swear to you, that is the only thing that committee has done. Um, and it, and what that means is that they never met once as a regular committee to talk about the things they want to talk about. Um, and that was outrageous uh, to me and uh, other people uh, as well. We talked at length about that. Um, and then one of the most egregious things uh, that, that, that I've ever seen the city council do is that they took three three docket items um, from George Darcy, uh, all having to do with bike and pedestrian advocacy um, and development. And they sent that 
to the master plan committee. They said, oh, you know, these are big, way too big ideas um, to be talked about just like in public safety, public works and public safety or ordinance and rules. We should be talking about this in the master plan committee. And so they sent it to the master plan committee, which had never met and didn't meet for a year and a half. And so, you know, Robert's rules exist uh, for a reason, usually it's like it's white supremacist, like slave owner reason, the reasoning. Uh, that's how old uh, Robert's Rules is. Um, but um, one of the interesting things is you can't filibuster in um, in Robert's Rules. Like people can either can people can take things off the docket. They can talk. They can vote. You know, they can vote things down, um, and they can even vote things out uh, down to not be talked about. Um, which has come up in Waltham uh, like only like once. Um, but it's very hard to filibuster their thing. Um, but what they did by sending it to an ad hoc committee, which literally didn't meet for a year and a half, that's essentially filibustering. Um, and so, uh, and, and what's hilarious about it is that during the master plan committee uh, input hearings, like 90% of the feedback was about the need for more uh, advocacy. And so instead of talking about it in the city council, they were like, oh, we need to send this to the master plan committee so we can discuss it. The only problem is they never discussed it in a public forum. And so we have no idea what they're talking about. They did make some decisions about consulting and stuff. So we do know decisions are being made, um, but we believe that that's only been done through like emails, which brings a slew of questions about open meeting law violations. Um, and so uh, that happened for a year and a half. Uh, and uh, and we looked on the docket uh, for this past uh, city council meeting or the one before that. Um, and what do we see on the docket is a, ref is a uh, recommendation by the master plan committee to um to file uh george darcy's resolution to look at building a bike and pedestrian advocacy committee which by the way many many other cities have um and so filing essentially means you can't talk about it for a year you're basically throwing it away not only throwing it away but you're you're not allowing anyone to talk about it for a year anything similar either um and so we were all pretty dumbfounded when we were when we figured this out uh where, when did they meet? How were they meeting? Uh, is this the first time they met? We still don't even know the answer to that. You know, we're, well, I'm going to talk about this. We're talking about this under the premise that this is the first time they met. I'm not really sure if that's true because uh, they could, there, there's really only one legal requirement. And if you're a fan of our show, you know this, it's the Bulletin Board of Truth outside of City Hall. Um, and uh, you have to post it 20, 48 hours uh, before the meeting is, is, um, is meeting um so that's the only legal requirement there are of course many ways to uh do outreach for your committee if you want people to watch it or if you want people's input on it uh there are many ways to not do this as well uh, which is exactly what happened um i actually want to show a clip of uh the city council meeting where they talk about this jonathan paz asks hey um when did this council, when did this committee meet and how is it advertised? And speaking of shitty body language, watch how Carlos Vidal uh, answers this. Um, of course, it should, in all, in all fairness, Carlos Vidal is not the chair of this committee and he shouldn't have to answer for it. But Randy wasn't there. So Carlos just like had to answer for it. But talk about shitty body language. You rise for point of information. Council pass. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, when did the master planning committee meet and how was it advertised? Thank you. I would have to refer to the clerk's office for that information. I, I don't clerk that one. Uh, I'm not, Councillor, when did the committee uh, I'm looking at my calendar. I know the chair is not present right now. It was Councillor LeBlanc. Let me just look, I'll tell you. Yeah. I believe it was a May meeting that was right. properly posted. Mm. It was in this committee room. You were there, right? Yeah, May 9th. Mm. Mr. Clerk, yep, May 9th at 6 p.m. Waltham City Hall. And so, um, and so there's no real answer to that. Like, why why wasn't anyone else notified? Why why were city councilors not aware that the master plan committee was meeting? Uh, much less us. Not even uh, many of the city councilors were confused. And so, and so. 
they uh, it should be also said that during all of these discussions about sending it to the Master Plan Committee, uh, in particular, Paul Cates and Kathy Ann Harris uh, talked about the uh, but about the issue was very important to them, and that's why they're saying it to the Master Plan Committee. It's very they care about this issue deeply, and so they're saying it to the Master Plan Committee. And so for a year and a half, they did nothing. And for about a, I mean, I think it was a year that this thing sat uh, in this committee. Nothing was talked about. And so without any discussion, any, you know, they didn't talk about it at the council when they filed it. Like, why? Why are you filing this? What what where was what was the robust discussion? Well, and and so I contacted Councillor Durkey about this specifically because he was on the master plan committee. And one of the reasons that he gave me for like, like the this whole process and the way that it unfolded was that uh they needed to uh remove the, they wanted to remove the bicycle and pedestrian safety committee from the list of items that were on the um like on the dock or on the table for the committee because they were going to just be presenting what was there to the a um contractor that they were going to be bringing in to help advise them on the uh master plan input and apparently also the mbta communities act like stuff that has to get done there so it sounds like this is all getting passed off to a contractor which again maybe they'll be better at facilitating an open meeting than the city council we'll see but i have no faith that their right whatever recommendation is then going to get acted on faithfully either based on how they've been based on the amount of input that was in favor of having better bike and pedestrian infrastructure and how this committee was unceremoniously removed also, I'm a little annoyed about this because I, it was like the first day that I was on vacation when this meeting allegedly happened. So that was, yeah. <laughs> what James is uh, James, what James is talking about is um, this idea that was floated during the master plan committee meetings was they should be hiring consultants to do a master plan committee, or at least you know take all the data uh, um, that. Uh, was from the master plan committee input hearings and compile all of that. Um, that was talked about. Uh, apparently, that is what's happening now, or they plan to do that. It's been so fucking long. Like, what the hell are they doing? It was doing? also not made clear to me where the decision was made, where that determination was made, yeah. and if it was at another master plan meeting that also was similarly advertised. Yeah, like, and also, also as a part of this exchange too, and just to share a little bit more of my frustration here. Uh, I when I first emailed Councillor Durkey about this and we talked about it, he had told me that he had penciled in a date for uh, June twenty second, so today, for another master plan committee meeting that I then kept an eye out for if it was then going to be advertised or any agenda posted for that one either, and I did not see it, so I asked the clerk and he and they confirmed that it was not scheduled, but. It, it's a little alarming that you've got this thing, this committee that's been meeting for a year and a half or that's been around for a year and a half and we still can't get more than 48 hours notice and when the meetings are happening and we still can't get minutes for the last meeting that uh, that happened either. Yeah, I'm totally untransparent. And, uh, you know, certain counselors or maybe all the counselors can feel as they can feel insulted by our calls for more transparency in local government. They're like, what are we talking about? Where's the most, you know, there's no issues of transparency at all. This is just one of those examples that we have to remember uh, to bring up when they say like, what's not transparent about welfare? Like, they look at us like we have, we have two heads. There, there's just time and time again, these instances where they just are making decisions about the future of Waltham without any consideration or input from this residents of all not even input just like notice just let us hear what you're talking about um and so the bike and pedestrian advocacy committee uh committee which i was very excited about um is now filed uh and george's uh one of his resolutions are complete. Also, I didn't even say it. John Sean Durkey's reasoning for why that was filed, so the consultants can can see can see the, what they have. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Literally, the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And so, the mystery of the master plan committee continues. Um, we don't really know when they're going to meet next. What they're going to talk about. What's going on with consultants? Like, 
why not just give an update? What is it? What, what consultants? What the fuck are we talking about? Where are the minutes? It's just mind blowing how untransparent um, that uh, committee is to me anyway. Um, okay. Uh, two more things. Uh, private ways. James, uh, there was a discussion on private ways recently and uh, James would like to tell us about it. So we're going to play a clip on private ways. Uh, this was from the uh, June 5th Public Works and Public Safety Committee meeting, and uh, Durkee was talking, or Councillor Durkee was talking to one of the uh, city solicitors about private ways, and we got a bit of a run through of the history of them, and essentially asking why the uh, city could not pay more for uh, paving a private way, and let's play the clip, and then we can talk a bit more about what private ways are. Understanding was that. Every day at school, um, school drop off and pick up, people use that road. Um, and so the, the concern was, I don't, I don't think anyone really cares if it's a private or public way. I think they're concerned about who has to pay for, you know, who has to pay for it and can someone else, are there circumstances where the city pays a higher percentage if the vast majority of people who are using it are using it for city purposes, not for, um, you know, because I think if, if the city said they were going to pay 100% of the cost, I don't think the residents would care either way if it's a public or private. Like, no one, that's that's not the relevant portion. But I'm sorry, do you want to say sure, something? Sure, I, I definitely do. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I definitely do. Yeah, so, um, so the way the statute is set up, when a private way is, um, when folks are going to petition the city to uh, do any sort of minor repairs to a private way, uh, the statute requires the city to have an ordinance in place and to set forth all of the requirements for uh, when we do that. So our, um, st specific to the number of folks that are gonna be on the petition and the percentage that will be required um, for, uh, okay, so we have 17-80. And so we've specifically put, and we have reduced it, 1780 for, um, a, lots of lots of lots of years used to be a 75 percent um 25 percent with the residents paying 75 percent the city of Walthing paying 25 percent um and it switched a number of years ago down to this 33 percent um for the residents and the city is now picking up that 66 percent so it, it seriously did a, a rather huge change with respect to what has been in existence for years and years and years and years um, now, the reason why the statute requires this um, uh, due process sort of um, law to be, uh, require us to put those requirements in ahead of time is because there is um, something in our Constitution that is it's called the Constitutional Public Purpose Requirement, and it um, won't let cities, municipalities, pay tax dollars for private businesses, for any sort of private um, benefit. And so in the private way situation, private landowners own from their home to the middle of the private way in front of them. So, and, and then the folks across the street own to the middle of that way. And so the city <laughs> doesn't have as high of a, it is true that there might be folks that drive around on the street, but the landowner themselves are deriving a serious um, betterment, benefit to their property that the rest of Waltham residents are not getting. And so that's, that's what the difference is. It is true that other taxpayers will be driving over the road, but the benefit that is separate and distinct and special to the private landowner is the um, upgrade market value that their home receives from the um, resurfacing of their actual property. So uh, private ways are roads that are built on uh, private land, but have like an easement for uh, nor the cars and everyone else to use them and they look just like normal roads uh 
much of these private ways in the city were uh, on plots of land purchased by developers and paved to support sprawling developments and sometimes also providing traffic cut throughs, which is its own separate problem. Uh, other times they are uh, done by developers to improve traffic flow. Uh, there's an example of one of these up by like the market basket to cut through to uh, I think Winter Street. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here for a second here to give to just to illustrate this app uh, created from uh, geographic info from uh, on Waltham's private ways by Eamon Dawes, who's running for city council in Ward Nine, and this is just illustrating and high highlighting the uh, private ways in the city, and you can see in a lot of these places these are the suburban cul-de-sacs and. Uh, just to zoom in here a little bit more like as an example of like what the what these areas look like and a lot of them are in relatively poor shape because roads are very expensive to maintain and you can see in some areas where betterment projects have happened they'll, 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 there's a bunch of these cul-de-sacs but then there's one that isn't and in the, the overall pattern for these things is that it is in sort of the northern part of Waltham is the greater density of private ways because this is where more of the suburban development had happened. There are examples of private ways in South Waltham too, kind of pretty famously around uh, Browns Ave in Felton Street area is a, a cluster of these private ways that are just in absolutely terrible condition. So uh <laughs> At the end of the day, roads are expensive to maintain and having to the road the road go from public to private changes who is responsible for paying maintenance. And this is something that would then be the city directly finan financially benefiting a private landowner if the city was to just un or just to categorically take control of these roads. However, in a lot of these cases, these roads have also been getting used for like general traffic and end up getting in much worse condition as a result of it. So there's a case to be made for the city just take ownership of all of these roads and fix them. And there's also like state money that is available by mileage. So the more of the roads that get turned over to public fund to public maintenance, the more of that money could then potentially be get, getting used for that. However, it is an extremely large cost to repave these roads and the nobody wants to pay for it. And the money that is available for this is limited. And uh, it's, this is sort of reflecting a, a problem inherent to the design pattern of sort of the suburban sprawl. Roads are an inefficient land use for transporting people in single, occup single occupancy vehicles and have a limited lifespan before needing resurfacing and in a lot of these suburban areas the the product the the economic product of those areas is not necessarily enough to support repaving the road up to it every 25 years it just isn't and it, however it is a general public good to have functioning roads in places where people live it to me just raises the question of how useful it is to have to, to continually be investing in suburban development if it is such a money pit for this type of thing. So under what circumstances would it no longer become a money pit to like repay a road? More of an issue, I think, for the areas that are not uh, like densely populated, because if it's like an area, a street with like five houses on it, when the bill comes due to repaving that street with five houses on it, it's then it's like a private way that's specifically those five houses that are going to have to pay for it all of the residents of waltham paying to pave basically the driveway or the cul-de-sac for five people mm -hmm. it's the case that the case that we made in that in that direction and here's a clip of councillor dunn asking about trying to use school funds to pay for the pavement of private ways and getting clarification that it is still public funds to town and I don't use that street but it sounds like it's almost exclusively used for the Plimpton school activities so is there any mechanism by which the school department can be responsible for the paving and maybe it doesn't have to be a full public way but it's maintained by the entity that uses it the most not that I'm aware of okay so it, the the paving of private ways is a very um, 
statutorily governed process. Um, that's all I can say is there's a statute that specifically requires municipalities to follow a, a, a very um, particular method of how we spend the tax dollars on private ways. Tax dollars, yes, but could it, could it, could it possibly come out of the school department's budget? I mean, that's Those their... Tax still, it's still tax Understood, but I'm just wondering if there's... I don't know. To me, it sounds like uh, in the real world, that would be like how it would turn out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that entity is using it. If, this, if the school department were a business, that would be a no-brainer, right? So they're in the business of running a school, and they're using a private street in order to, you know, work that business. It's, it's, it's not used for just school well, people drop their kids off might use it, but the school doesn't use it. Well, I disagree, but okay. I don't, understood I, what you're saying. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I've always been in the camp of um, wanting to convert all private ways into public ways for those, you know, for those that want it. Um, I even ran on that in my city council run. Um, but yeah, in the past year, James and a couple other friends have been, you know, uh, preaching the idea that like why? Why would we do that? Why? Why would we spend taxpayer money on streets that most people will never drive on? Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, neither here nor there now. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about. And, and I think there is a case to be made that, like, for specifically for roads that are used as cut throughs or for accessing like houses in general, like for example, like. I forget which road this is here, but this is like an example of like ones that th there there are numbers that that are like in pretty poor condition that are generally used as access roads to cut through the city. And I mean, like, I don't think that it makes sense to. I think that that, that there this is like a a problem that like has been with the city for a while and is symptomatic of how the development happened, and also. The fact that it's difficult to pay for this out of our operating budget reflects sort of the poor land use of low density housing. And I think that that's also sort of fascinating if you zoom out to this and were to then overlay. I think I'm going to have to cut in a graphic for this, but like the MVTA Communities Act bubbles over where like the private way density is. It most of the, those two bubbles are sort of in the southern portions of the city which are also not where most of the not private ways are too, or because most of the suburban development sprawled out in, in the northern part of the city in, uh, in, in these sort of large development clusters. And the sort of city is, if the city was to sort of take on repaving all these roads or ownership of all these roads, it would just be taking on a, lar a larger liability outside of the area where most of the new density is supposed to be getting planned for. And I think that that sort of is part of what is so important about like the master planning committee and sort of taking a holistic look at transportation and like how do people, how are people supposed to live in and get around in the city? So basically like in order to justify like the city taking control and maintaining public ways, it has to have enough of a density to justify it as a public good, as opposed to just like a private amenity. Yeah, I think that that would be the the the, 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 the uh, case that I would make there on that on that front, because it's also like the, the same problem is like no one likes seeing a road full of potholes or like in disrepair and stuff, and it is like a big liability for homeowners to have to take care of that if they live in a private like, neighborhood. But at the same time, having a private single family house in a private cul de sac is a extremely rare thing in this country or an increasingly rare thing in this country and to then sort of have the windfall of the city taking over all the repairs on that too on top of everything else in the current sort of economic climate is a little bit discordant i think i see i see well thank you james um speaking of expensive cul-de-sacs um we're gonna talk a little bit about the lexington solar farm um just a very quick update uh the city was just in executive session for um, a couple of hours um, talking about what to do with the Lexington Solar Farm, because I guess I should say um, Lexington did approve that despite, you know, all of us being so mad about it in Waltham. Uh, they, uh, Lexington 
voted to approve it. Um, and so we're looking at what what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this? And so they were in executive session for two hours. Um, they, you know, you only go into executive session for a few reasons. Um, and one of them uh, is uh, legal litigation or uh, I forget the exact wording on it. I think that's right. Um, but uh, we're looking at the what legal ways we can stop Lexington from building a solar farm. And so, um, we, it, you know, it needs to be opined upon. Is the city of Waltham going to sue the city of Lexington, even though they know that it's a bogus thing to do and it's definitely going to lose? Are they going to do all of that to appease uh, a rich cul-de-sac uh, of people? And so it's starting to look like it's going to happen. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really part of that neighborhood. I, uh, George Darcy, who was the ward city councilor, um, who still is, I guess, um, he brought up concerns. So, I mean, if George has concerns, then maybe I should be concerned. I'm just like, I'm always like really satisfied when rich people don't get their way. Um, they're very not used to it. And I'm sure the people that live in that, uh, cul-de-sac are not used to not getting their way. So I just find that kind of funny. Um, but I mean, I'm sure there are legitimate concerns, uh, but Lexington didn't think so. Uh, and now they're building a solar farm uh, and we might sue the city of Lexington. Related, related to this, uh, in the June 20th Public Works Committee meeting, uh, the uh, high voltage resolution uh, submitted by Randy LeBlanc came up. And this is about uh, e EMF from high voltage power lines, you know, allegedly causing cancer. And they're sort of discussing that. And I have to wonder if this is in some way related to like the that solar farm or resisting future solar farms like that. 100%, because that's what gets me hung up on this so much too. Like this is such a unserious campaign. Like I just checked their website to make sure Waltham Neighbors for Safe Solar still had this up, but they're still claiming that, yeah, EMF radiation from like solar panels and transmission lines cause cancer and similar things, which is so evidently like does not. This has been like so widely studied. Um, like it's just like, I don't know, like radio waves causing cancer is like the conspiracy theory you make fun of, right? And then here they are still running with this nonstop. Um, I don't know. I, I think it just very really deeply shows that they're very unserious about the actual health effects of this and are just looking for excuses and to like block it from their backyard to protect their property values. And yeah, the fact that city may be gearing up to sue, just wasting city money on this is yeah. deeply um, embarrassing. It, sh it shows where the priorities are for resources to get spent on this versus like, you know, delivering actual safe infrastructure for people who live in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how much money spent versus the votes that they kept going for them is, is going to be pretty significant. Um, I think if they decide to sue the city of Lexington, um, I can't remember. I, and and that's that was literally hearsay, but um, there is precedent for bogus court cases the city of Waltham makes to appease voters. I'm going to find that and I'm going to bring it back, but there's precedent for this and I'm going to bring that back to the next debrief. Um, so it's not unheard of. Um, okay, that's going to do it. This is a long one. Uh, so thank you. Uh, everyone for listening. Thank you, James and Thomas, for uh, coming on. Um, the next city council uh, meeting is the council committee council end of session. Uh, we're going to do an episode about that. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, we're going to do um, a session wrap up, which I really like. We all get together in person and we talk about the uh, session. We've done two of those already. Um, excited uh, to do that. Um, and that means that we've been doing this for uh, a year and a half. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Uh, looking forward to celebrating, uh, with you all, with you both and some other friends as well, um, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Sounds good. Bye everyone.